Okay, so hello and welcome everyone to our webinar, Deep Learning for Free Text Generation, Rap Songs and Shakespeare. My name is Catherine and I'm one of the data scientists in the evangelism team at Nine. I'm here today together with Rosaria, um, who is the head of our evangelism team at Nine, and she is going to do the second part of this presentation. Before we start, a few things about the technical setup. Um, please use our question and answer section to post your questions and also to upvote questions from other attendees. And just for your information, the session is recorded and will be also available later on YouTube. How can you ask questions? To ask your questions, you can just click on the question and answer button on the bottom of your Zoom application in the toolbar. This will open a new window and in this window you can write your questions and also upload questions from other people. And then we will either answer your questions in the chat or we will answer them live in the end of this webinar. What are we going to talk about today? So we want to show you today how you can train recurrent neural networks to generate free text. Uh, on one hand, rap songs, but also how you can generate um, product names or write in Shakespeare stuff. And this is the second part of this webinar, which Rosaria is going to cover. But I will start first with an introduction to recurrent neural networks, which we use to generate free text and LSTM units. And in my talk, I will start with a quick review on neural networks before we dive into recurrent neural networks. And we will talk about why do we actually need recurrent neural networks when it comes to sequential data. And then in the last part of my presentation, we will go through the different steps which are involved in a language modeling uh, project or a project for text generation. So let's start with a quick review on what are neural networks. Historically, neural networks are inspired by a biological neural network. And if we think about the word neural networks, then it's based out of two words, a neuron and a network. And when a neuron, what is a neuron? A neuron is, uh, has some inputs and a solid body and based on the inputs the neuron then produces some outputs and one single neuron itself um, is not really clever yet but if we combine many of these neurons in a network like in the brain then a neural network a biological neural network can solve a lot of uh, complicated tasks and if we now want to model a biological neural network then we can also start by modeling only one single neuron and then combine many of these single neurons into a network. And how can we model one single neuron? What we have here is then also some inputs, which we use to calculate an output. And to calculate the output, what we normally do is we take the linear combination of our inputs. This means we take our inputs and each input we multiply with a weight and we take the sum of it, what we see here, and we add some bias. And this linear combination we put then into an activation function, for example, the sigmoid function, which gives us always values between zero and one, which then tells us whether this neuron is activated or not. And then we can combine many of them, as I said, into a network. And a fully connected feed forward network has then always an input layer and an output layer, here the first and the last layer, and then one or uh, many hidden layers in between. And in the feed forward network, information only travels from the input to the output and we don't have any backward connections. This means we always take the values from the layer from the previous layer to calculate the activations in the next layer by always calculating the linear combination of either the inputs or the activations from the layer um, from the previous layer um, to calculate then the activations in the next. Layer. And when we train a neural network, a feed forward network, like this one, then the goal is to find these weights that we get the correct result as output. This means, for example, if we want to train a network, which tells us whether there is a cat on an image or not, then we want to train the weights in a way that if we feed into this network here an image with a cat, that we get here a high value out, so a value close to one, a probability close to one that we have a cat on this image. And if we have as input, uh, image without a cat, then we want to have here a value close to zero. So we use a lot of label samples to find the correct weights for this um, network using an algorithm which is known as backpropagation. Um, I said in the beginning, one of the act possible activation functions is the sigmoid function, which has always values between zero and one. But 
um, you don't always have to use the sig mode functions. There are many other um, activation functions available and some other frequently used activation functions are, for example, the hyperbolic tangents or tanh for short, which has as output always values between minus one and one. Or another commonly used activation function is the ratified linear unit ReLU, ReLU for short, which is zero for all negative values. And then we have just the identity function, um, which is used a lot in deep neural networks because um, it improves the learning process. I will come back to this diagram later. That's why I want to show it here one more time to you in a little bit simplified version, instead of having here the weights on all our connections um, between the different neurons. I say we have just a matrix with all the weights, which I call W2 for the one which we use to calculate the activations in the second layer and W3 to calculate the activation in the third layer or in our case, the output layer. So now that we have an idea of what neural networks are, I would like to start talking about what are recurrent neural networks and what are LSTM units. Let's start with the question, what are recurrent neural networks? And recurrent neural networks are a special family of neural networks, which are extremely or especially powerful when it comes to sequential data. And sequential data can be all kinds of data. It could be text, what would mean a sequence of words or a sequence of characters, or it could be also a sequence of numerical values, like for example, the sequence of the temperature of a temperature sensor. And recurrent neural networks are used for all sorts of tasks. And I'm pretty sure that all of you have used at some point today, a recurrent neural network already. Um, for example, while writing an email and Google was giving you some recommendations, which word you might want to use next. And this is, for example, a language model where recurrent neural networks are often used. Another example is text classification. Here we have a sequence as input, for example, some tweets. Uh, if we want to perform sentiment analysis to find out whether the sentiment of a tweet is positive or negative, this means we have a sequence as input. That the text itself, and then as output, we get a label either positive or negative. Another example where recurrent neural networks are used, where we have a sequence as input and as output is neural machine translation, because then we have our um, starting language, which is where we have the content as a sequence of words, and we want to produce um, the translation, which is again a sequence of words. Other examples are image captioning or speech to text, but they don't always have to be text. As I said, it could be also numerical data, like for example, time series data um, where we have sensor data. But why do we actually need recurrent neural networks when, if we have sequential data? Um, let's say we want to train a network to translate sentences from German to English. And we have in our training set the sentence, ich mag Schokolade, what means I like chocolate. One option, if we want to use a feed-forward network, which I just introduced, um, is to train a network that translates word by word. And then our network would learn, if I see ich as input, I produce the output I. And if I have mark as input, then I produce the output like. And if I have chocolate as input, I produce the output chocolate. And then this network would um, be, would, could translate the sentence, ich mag Schokolade, into I like chocolate. But what would happen then with the sentence or the question, mag ich Schokolade, what means do I like chocolate? If I now use this trained network to translate this sentence, then we would translate mag into like, ich into I and Schokolade into chocolate. And the sentence would be like I chocolate. What is grammatically not a correct English sentence or question because the correct translation would be do I like chocolate? And the problem with feed forward networks is that they take each um, input in a sequence completely independent from all the other inputs or values in the sequence around it. So we don't have any context information. And for example, for translation, we do need this context information. Or more general, we need a network that remembers inputs from the past when we have sequential data. And the solution for this are these recurrent neural networks because they can remember inputs from the past and add context information. And what you see here is a way of how recurrent neural networks are often visualized um, in two ways, uh, which I took from a really famous black blog post by Christopher Ola, which helped me a lot in the beginning to understand how uh, recurrent neural networks work. And I will first focus on the picture here on the left, where we have this so-called loop connection. 
And you can see here now information is not only flowing from the input from the bottom to the output on the top, but in addition, we feed some information which the network's outputs already back into the network again. So we have some recurrent connection. And on the right hand side, you see the so called unrolled way of this network, where we see multiple copies of the same network. This means really of the same weights that we apply to our to each step in our sequence. And in addition, we have some additional hidden states that connect the different copies of this network. And how is this now related to our feed forward network, which I introduced before? So you probably remember this diagram here, which I showed before, and this one I want to simplify now even a little bit more. So I don't visualize the different inputs anymore, but I just say I have an input vector X and the full network is here in the box and it just produces some output. And I make a few more changes. I say now the input comes from the bottom and the output comes from the top. And now I add on one hand an additional hidden input state and an additional hidden output state. And now I just take multiple copies of the same workflow, uh, of the same network. This means really of the same weights. So we share the weights um, in the different steps. And I always apply this network to the different values in my sequence. But in addition, this network has an additional input always where we have also some of the information that the network saw in the previous steps. So for example, if we feed in here now the third word of our sequence to make the next prediction, then we don't make this prediction only based on the third word in our sequence, but in this hidden state, we remember also a par part of the information of the first input and the second input in some kind of dense hidden state representation. And this looks already much more like the diagram which I showed you from the blog post of Christopher O. And here we see now a really simple recurrent neural network unit with only one layer. This means what we what this simple recurrent neural unit does is it always takes the hidden state and the new input. So we have here two vectors, we stack them on top of each other, and then we apply the tanh, the train tanh layer on top uh, on them. And then we get some output, which we can use to make a prediction. And on the other hand, we use this also as input in the next time step. This really simple layer structures has some limitations when it comes to memory, um, so that it's sometimes too limited to be actually useful. And we have, and if we have a language model where we use this really simple layer structure, then this model probably performs quite well on the sentence cast drive on the to predict that the next word is road. But if we have longer dependencies, like in the second example here, I love the beach, my favorite sound is the crashing of the, the model probably has forgotten already that I talked about the beach earlier and that the correct word is the crashing of the waves, because the crashing of could be also the crashing of the cars if I would describe an accident or the crashing of glass if I describe that I'm cooking at the moment. And to overcome these problems with, or the problem with this long dependencies, we can use so-called long short term memory units or LSTMs for short. And here you see now a picture of LSTM units. And the first thing you probably recognize is that instead of having only one um, hidden state that connects the different copies, we have here now two hidden states. And we have in addition, this often called cell state here on the top, which travels through our di diagram on the top right through the whole chain. And therefore it's pretty easy for information to uh, for the network to remember information or to save information in the cell state. In addition, an LSTM unit uses a special uh, concept, which is called the concept of gates. And an LSTM unit has three gates and for gut gate, an input gate and an output gate. And a gate is always um, realized uh, by a sigmoid function, because remember a sigmoid function gives you values between zero and one. If it is a value close to zero, this is information that we want to delete. If it is a, a value close to one, then this is information that we want to keep. And as I said, it had three gates. Uh, always after we see an input, the network decides which of the information in my cell state do I want to delete? Because for example, we could say in the cell state, we somehow um, encode in a dense representation whether the subject that we have at the moment is plural or singular, and we have now as input a new subject, then we might want to delete this information. And this could be something the forget gate does. Then we create here or the short-term memory um, or the LSTM unit 
always creates here a new possible content state. And with the input gate, we then decide which of the information do we actually want to add to our cell state. And then we have the output gate where we decide which of the information in our cell state is now important to us. For example, if we have had a subject as last input, we might want to output whether it's a plural or, um, or a, a singular subject and that the next wor word should be a verb. Um, and this is done by this output gate. And we now see that these, all of these LSTM units always have an input and an output, but actually we don't always have to use all of these inputs or all of these outputs. And that's why we can have different network structures for different applications. And one option is to have a sequence as input and a sequence as output. And then we normally talk about a many-to-many -many recurrent neural network. And also there we have two options. We have the option that we say always when we see an input, we directly create also a prediction of our sequence. And the other option is to say we train two different recurrent neural network units, um, an encoder and a decoder, and we first just input our sequence and then we have a dense representation and then we ja uh, start generating our sequence. And an example uh, for this many-to-many -many, or an example application for a many-to-many -many recurrent neural network where we directly always create also an output would be a language model and something where we first consume a sequence and then we start generating a sequence uh, like the one here on the right would be a neural, uh, an, applica an example application would be neural machine translation. Other option is, options are to train recurrent neural networks in a many-to-one uh, way or in a one-to-many. This means if we train many-to-one, then we have an input se a sequence as input, but we produce only one output. Here, example use cases are language classification or text classification. And an example for one-to-many would be image captioning, where we have one image as input, and then we start generating a sequence as output. Now that we talked a little bit about recurrent neural networks, I want to continue with the different steps which are involved in training a recurrent neural network for text generation. And the first thing we have to decide is whether we want to train our recurrent neural network on character, subword, or word level. And there are pros and cons for all of them. Uh, why would you train a model on word level? Um, of course, when we talk, we don't think about different characters, but we think in um, that uh, we structure our language or our language is structured in word level. And another advantage is that the length of a sequence is much shorter compared to character level. On the other hand, training a network on character level has the advantage that the dictionary is much smaller because we have 26 different characters in our dictionary only. And if you think about the dictionary or the number of words that we have in a language, that's much uh, more. And therefore, training a network on character level is much more manageable. And the other advantage that we have is that we have the ability to also generate new words. Because if we train on word level and we say we just take the 20 or you know, the 10,000 most frequent words in a language, then of course we can also only predict these 10,000 different words and we cannot come up with other words which are not in our dictionary. And what I saw as well recently is that people started to also train on sub word level, which seems to be the happy medium between training on word level and character level. Now then we want to start training our recurrent neural networks for text generation, we have to think about what kind of data can be used to actually train our recurrent neural network and how can we prepare our data for the training. Um, to train your, so what kind of data can you use? Um, here you can basically use any kind of text and there are two different ways how you can prepare your data for the training. Because you can train your neural network either in a many-to-one way or in a many-to-many way. The examples which we will show today, we decided to train our networks on character level. And if you want to train your network on character level using many to one, then you would use a sliding window approach to prepare your data. This means the way we prepare our data is that we decide a window length, for example, three. And then our training set would like, like this, that we have always an input sequence with three characters, and then the output is the next character in the sequence. So for example, MOU as input, and the predicted output should be N. The other option is to train in a many-to-many -many way, where we shift our input sequence 
by one character by adding a star token compared to the output sequence. This means if our network or our network gets its input already the whole word, uh, but in the, as the first character a star token, and as output the also the whole word, but in the end an additional n token. Then we also need some data transformation because remember in neural network, uh, there we want to use some formulas and formulas uh, perform on numbers and not on letters. This means we need to translate our numbers into our letters into numbers. Uh, and, or we have to find a way to represent each character in a way that our model can understand it. And one option is to say, okay, I encode each character with one integer value, for example, A with one, B with two, C with uh, three and so on. By doing this, you would add some kind of distance between the different characters, because then it would mean that A and B are somehow closer to each other than A and C, because the, distance, uh, the difference is higher. And that's why instead of using only an integer encoding, what we would normally would use is a so-called one-hot encoding, where you represent each character uh, by a one-hot vector, which has only one, one in the vector, and besides this, only zero. And how can we um, do such a transformation in Nyman Analytics Platform? Um, or I did it in a two-step encryption. I created first an index-based encoding where I extracted a, a dictionary using this unique term extractor node. And then I assigned to each letter an index. And then I used the, index, uh, the dictionary replacer node um, to replace the different characters with this number or with the index. And then to create, based on this index encoding, um, the one-hot encoding, this is something that we can do in Nyman Analytics Platform with the Keras Network Learner node, because here you can select in the configuration a conversion type, and one conversion type is from collection of number to one-hot tensor, and then it would take this um, index-based encoding and create a one-hot vectors where you have always the one then at the position um, of the number that you have in your index-based encoding. And this is now a NIME workflow, which you can use to train a neural network for free text generation um, without writing code. So what does this workflow do? On one hand, we have here the pre-processing node where we read in our data set and we prepare it using this, um, one hot, uh, this index-based encoding. Then here in the upper part, we define the network which we want to train. Um, using these Keras layer nodes uh, from the Keras extension. So we have here, for example, the Keras input layer node, which defines our input shape. And uh, then we have the Keras LSTM layer node, where we have the LSTM units. We use a dropout layer node for regularization. And then we have two dense layers, uh, one with a linear activation function and one with the softbox activation function. And then we can train our network using this Keras network learner node. Um, and here I do some post-processing where I add an additional uh, parameter, which is called temperature, which about which I will talk in a second a little bit more. And then I convert it into a TensorFlow uh, model and save it um, to make predictions later on to generate new text. And what is now the output of this model and how can we use it? The output, uh, when we apply our trained neural network, is then always the probability dif distribution over the different characters. This means uh, here as output, we get for each character, the probability um, based on the sequence we saw until now or we generated until now. And then we have two options how we can use this probability distribution. One option is to just use the character with the highest probability. This means here in my little example after RED, uh, the, highest the highest probability would get the space um, which could lead to a name like Red Hill. But this has the disadvantage that with the same star token, it would always also lead to the same results. The other option is to not take the as next character, the character with the highest probability, but to sample according to the probability distribution that we get. And then we would, that we have as output, and then we have a different result in each execution. And if our goal is to generate a lot of new different names, then the option two is probably the better option. To apply the network um, to generate new text, we can then build a second workflow, a deployment workflow, where we read our TensorFlow uh, model, and then we predict one character after the other. And to do this in Nyman Analytics Platform, we can use a recursive loop, where in each iteration, 
we always predict the next current, uh, the, we apply the network to get our probability distribution. We extract the next character and then we feed the next predicted character back into our recursive loop. So this loop always, um, here we have the loop body and in this loop body we always extract, we predict the next character and we feed it back into the beginning until we get an end token um, that we say, okay, now we are finished with our predictions. The problem that we sometimes see during deployment is that our network ends up in a loop where it starts to predict always the same words over and over again. So for example, here it starts with a nice fairy tale and then it starts with, uh, it continues with who was to sleep, who was to sleep, who was to sleep and so on. To avoid this problem, we can add an additional parameter to control the creativity of our model by changing the confidence of the model after training. This means we train our model first and then we introduce the temperature parameter. And if we have a temperature below one, then it downplays the less likely predictions. And if we have a temperature higher than one, then it emphasizes the li uh, least likely predictions. I have here now an example. So let's say we have our probability distribution um, where we have the probability for one character 0 0.8, then 0 0.1, and for the two others 0 0.05 and 0 0.05. If you have a temperature of one, nothing changes. If you have a temperature, for example, for 10, uh, of 10, this means a temperature higher than one, then it emphasizes the least likely predictions. This means um, characters for, which have a lower predictions get a higher prediction, a uh, high, higher probability and values that have already a high probability get a lower probability. So it's more likely to predict each of these different characters. This means we would end up also with more different words um, or yeah, with more different words, but we would get also rather words which, which might be not really words. On the other hand, if we have a temperature lower than one, for example, 0 0.1, then we downplay the less likely predictions. And here we see now the probability, which is already really high with 0 0.8, becomes even higher with 0 0.99. And the probabilities which are already low become even lower. This means we, we are likely to predict only the ones which have already a, higher, a high probability. And to change the confidence um, of our network, we can add this temperature value. And we ask this edit, it is added in the softmax function. Um, and what we input into the softmax function here is this linear combination um, of our inputs. And what we do by adding the temperature is to divide this linear combination of our inputs with the weights by this temperature value. And as you saw in my presentation, I used Nyman Analytics Platform um, for, the, uh, for this project. And if you are new to Nyman Analytics Platform, then I have here a promotion code for you to get our beginner slug book. Um, to get started using NIME and then work also on NIME projects like this one. And, as, uh, and you can get a free copy of it by using the code deeplearning0620. Um, and with this, I reach the end of my part of the presentation and I hand over to Rosaria. Okay, so <laughs> welcome on the application part of this of this talk. Um, so since uh, I am the kind of the uh, veteran of this group, uh, I would like to have a little uh, trip back in time. So um, it, it used to be in the 60s, you had the 60s, 70s, you had these kind of expert systems and the stress there was about the word expert. So there was an expert who was actually transferring his knowledge um, to the system, right? Then uh, and between the 80s and the 90s, you had the uh, machine learning, a lot of the machine learning, and the stress there was about the machine learning themselves uh, about the task. We had the data mining. There, the stress was about the data. So the whole uh, knowledge was already in the data, and we were supposed to discover that. Performance, we had the big data, and then um, you know, larger the, the, large, the larger the amount of data, uh, the bigger performance is the algorithm and the machine needed to have. Um, uh, then we had the data science again, faster uh, self-learning algorithms. And then now we are talking about artificial intelligence. So I've been wondering in the last um, 
months what was that what was the new flavor that artificial intelligence was bringing to the to the field um so could it be for example that is the creativity so traditionally we use the machine learning and especially the neural networks uh, to uh, automate or to uh, perform a task based on some examples right so we perform a classification there are there is a training set they they learn from this training set and then they perform some uh, the, the class, they implement the classification task. So now what I'm going to present in this talk, I'm going to present the three uh, particular tasks. One is about naming new products. One is about writing a song and one is about writing in Shakespeare style. Those are what is uh, um, usually deemed as a uh, um, creative tasks. So those are not the classic tasks that the neural networks do. So let's see how they perform in that. Um, the first task was about product naming. What happens when a new product is born? When a new product is, is born, you have to name it. It seems easy, but actually it's a very complex uh, phase of the, uh, the whole uh, product um, uh, management um, chain. So here you have the most brilliant and most creative minds of your company. They sit together and they try to think of a new product. In our case, we had a new uh, clothing line. Uh, it was an outdoor hiking clothing line. And we wanted to find, uh, we wanted to find a new uh, name, a name for this clothing line that was evoking the feeling of nature, that was sounding familiar enough to the customers because you know if you know it it stays more in your mind on the other hand it doesn't have to be so known because it has to stand out from the competition and especially it has to not exist because if it doesn't exist already then the copyright laws are much easier to to deal with um so the, the idea is that these uh, uh brilliant minds of the company they have to um make a list of potential candidates and then choose from these potential candidates. Could a neural network help with this creative process? So what we did here, this is actually a workflow from Catherine, um, we had a data set, we extracted from Wikipedia via, via a Wikidata query, 30, 33,000 and something names of mountains in the US. So the, the data set was made of a long list of mountain names uh, from mountains in the US, right? right? Like something like that. So based on this list, then we created this uh, neural network. We had each character in the name of the mountain was one hot encoded. So all zero for the missing characters and one for the only character that we are considering. Then we made a sequence of all these characters to form the word. And then we were feeding a past of N characters into the network. The network had one input layer of the size of the one hot vector that we are feeding as input, right? And then it had one LSTM layer with a number of states. And then we, we used other two layers. One was the, uh, a dense layer with a linear activation function. And most importantly, the last layer was a, a, a feed forward layer with the softmax activ activation function. The softmax activation function was used because uh, it's uh, easily interpretable as a um, probability. So at the end, you, we would have uh, again, the size of the output layer would be the same as the size of the one hot encoding uh, of the characters of this vector. Um, and each position of the vector corresponds to a character. The character with the highest probability is the character that has been predicted by the network. So at the end, we feed one hot encoded vectors, a sequence of one hot encoded vectors into the network, and we get as output a sequence of probabilities of the next for the next character. So we train the network to predict always the next character in uh, from the sequence. Okay, so the DLSTM states were uh, we decided to have them at, as 256. And then of course, the size of the input vector and of the output vector is given by the dictionary size, the uh, character set that we are using. And we had uh, uh, um, uh, 95 uh, characters uh, used uh, uh, in our uh, training set. Okay, so to do that, we use the nine keras integration. So the nine keras integration is uh, 
uh, an integration of the Keras library within uh, NIME. The Keras libraries are built on, tens on TensorFlow and then TensorFlow is built on Python. So at the end, you need to install uh, Python and the Keras libraries and then on top of that, the, the NIME Keras integration. The advantage of using the uh, NIME Keras integration is that you can take full advantages of the Keras functions. It's fully open source, uh, but you don't need to code because you can use the codeless graphical user interface of, uh, of NIME, the classic one from NIME. And this is a, uh, an extract of the nodes that are available uh, from the, Keras NIME, the, the NIME Keras integration. Yes, uh, I meant codeless, exactly. And that, that was the network that we wanted to build. And this is the network that we actually put together using the nodes from the Keras integration. So as you see, there was one node building the input layer, one node building the LSTM layer, one node for the first dense layer with linear activation function, and then one node for the output dense layer with the softmax activation function. So it's pretty, it was pretty easy. Um, so this is the uh, training workflow that uh, Catherine put together. So here you can see that uh, we uh, clean the data, we read the data, we transform the input of the data set. You remember we needed this one hot encoding, so we do it in this meta node here. Uh, all the uh, transformations here is uh, hidden inside this meta node. Um, then here we build our uh, network, the one that we have seen before. Um, we uh, train the model using this Keras network learner, and then at the end, we do a bit of post-processing um, editing uh, to introduce the temperature coefficient that uh, Catherine was talking about. And then finally, we save the model in, tensor, in TensorFlow format because we want to use it in deployment, and if you use it in TensorFlow format, it's a bit faster. Now, the ones of you who were paying attention, they have noticed that before I proposed four layers, and actually here there are five layers. So one layer is this dropout layer, which is a temporary layer to introduce some randomness in the training of the weights of the network. And this randomness is the one that um, can help to avoid the overfitting of the network. Neural networks are, you know, can grow out of control because you keep adding neurons, 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 and then probably you get with something which is over, uh, overshooting the whole uh, uh, problem. So the, these, uh, um, um, uh, drop out and these techniques to avoid the overfitting can help you uh, with controlling uh, exactly the overfitting of the network. Uh, you have seen this one already. Uh, Catherine was showing that to you. This is the deployment workflow. So what we did, we trained the network from one character to predict the next character, right? Um, so we have one character, we predict the next character. Then the character that was predicted is fed back into the input and then from this character, we predict again the next character. The, ca the output character is fed back into the input of the network and so on and so on and so on. And that's why here you have this uh, loop, the recursive loop start and the recursive loop end, loop end. In this way, you need a trigger at the beginning, one character trigger at the beginning that triggers the whole process of automatically generated one character after the next, uh, the, the name of the mountain. So, and that's how we generated the names. Do you want to see the names? So those were some of the names that uh, uh, have been generated. They are all fake. Um, they look, they sound reasonable, but they are actually all fake names. Uh, the advantages is that they remind you of mountains. That's what we wanted to have. They sound familiar enough because they are somehow inspired by existing mountains. They evoke the feeling of nature because they sound realistic. I, on the other hand, they don't exist, so there are no copyright issues. You can uh, generate them automatically in 10 seconds, and then you can generate uh, as many as you want, 200, 300, 1,000, and no people have been involved in the generation of these uh, new names. Could this be considered a creative task? I would, I would say it's already quite a creative task, but let's see the next one. So let's try to generate a rap song. Uh, the whole story of the rap song started because at some point we generated a teacher bot. So the teacher bot was giving you recommendation about the next uh, article that you were supposed to read uh, to learn about a given topic. So uh, the, the whole uh, qu question and answer, the answer of the, of the bot, they were uh, pre prepackaged. So it was a uh, um, static text and I mean, it sounded fun, nice, but it was kind of uh, static. 
So uh, I was investigating the speaking styles and uh, I found this uh, website uh, that uh, uh, lists uh, 60 possible speaking, <coughs> speaking styles that you can use uh, for your boat. And for example, you have a, a crisp speaking style, a declamatory speaking style, euphemistic, and then of course the one that I like the most, which is the incoherent speaking style. So how should my boat speak? I can have, I, I am a bit, uh, I simplify the problem. And so to simplify the problem, I move from 60 speaking styles to only two. One style is kind of polite, almost poetic, and one style is uh, affirmative, uh, borderline impolite. So let's try with these two speaking styles. The first speaking style, the one almost poetic, I used, uh, I wanted to uh, simulate um, the speaking style, the writing style of Shakespeare. For the impolite, I have decided to use uh, the text from rap songs. So let's start with the impolite. We want to generate a rap song, a fake rap song. Um, this is just a free, a free text generation problem, like the one that we used before for the mountain names. Um, okay, so it's not, it's, it's similar, but it's not just one name, it's a longer complete sentence. It's a bit more complex than the previous task. So I can start and build a similar network from scratch, like the one that I had before about the generation of mountain names. But since uh, I like to recycle stuff that already exists and it's available on the internet, I know all of you do that. Uh, so I started searching for, for Catherine's example on the Nime Hub. So, Let's find it, let's download it, and then let's readapt the workflow uh, for my own rap song generation rather than uh, uh, something else. So on the Nime Hub, this is the uh, link. Uh, you can just connect uh, and then you can search for examples of whatever topic. So I brought in there generate mountain names because I remember that Catherine was, uh, um, so the, the, the workflow of Catherine, that's what it was doing. And I found, uh, this is the list of uh, answers, and I found these uh, uh, possible examples from uh, uh, Catherine's page. So I clicked, uh, I went onto the page, that was the workflow. I clicked download workflow, and then I imported my workflow onto my NIME analytics platform. Good. So um, I decided to use a similar neural networks, just a little bit different. So for example, I removed this uh, one hidden layer with the linear activation function. And I used this, instead of a network with four layers, I used a network with three layers, one hidden layer with LSTM units. But the rest is quite similar. The rest, it still includes a sequence of one hot encoded characters. And the sequence is as, uh, it can be as long as you want. Uh, of course, the goal is to include words in there. So before we had to predict mountain names and we had only one uh, character to predict the next characters. Here we want to have many characters to predict the next one. Okay, so we experimented with uh, uh, past 50 characters or past 100 characters. So we see which one, um, we, we check the one, we use the one that at the end worked the best. Um, again, the dictionary size here, it's a bit smaller. It's only 86 characters. So the input vector, the one hot, the one hot encoded input vector um, is a, a, size, a size 86. Uh, the LSTM states we took again uh, 256. Uh, at the end, we ended up on 100 past characters, even though we experimented with uh, uh, more or less than 100. And I'm going to explain you why. Um, and then at the end, as a training set, uh, we use 23 popular rap songs. Again, uh, the output is a, a, um, a layer of uh, um, neurons uh, with activation function softmax, and the softmax again produces the probability of one character to be the next character uh, with respect to what you have at the input. The character with the highest probability is the one that is going to be adopted as the predicted character uh, for the input sequence. Okay, so let's see uh, how the, uh, the neural network works. Uh, again, uh, you see here three uh, layers, but actually there is this extra dropout layer I already talked about to um, somehow avoid the overfitting. Um, here there is the pre-processing of all the rap songs. There are the, you need to reshape the text, you need to clean up a bit. So there are a, a number of things that you need to do. 
And then finally, uh, with this leg like column, you build uh, the vector of past characters that you want to feed into the network. So uh, you are going to have a, a long list of characters, a long sequence of characters, and then using the leg like column ne uh, ne node, for each character, you also build a past of 150, 200 characters that you want to use for the network. Again, we uh, use the Keras Network Learner to train the network, and then we save uh, the result. This is the deployment workflow. It works exactly the same like the previous workflow. There is a recursive loop uh, again, and the recursive loop is because I have my 100 characters at the input, I produce the next character. I feed the, ne the next character back into the input. I use now the new vector of 100, the new uh, sequence of 100 characters. I predict the character number 102, feed it back into the input sequence. I predict character 103 and so on and so on. So again, the recursive loop which is needed <coughs> in the deployment workflow. Okay, so those are the results. Uh, I don't know, are you ready to see the results of the AI generated rap songs? Um, so uh, I have to give the first 100 characters as trigger uh, to the generation of the rap songs. So in this case, I use the first 100 character taken from a popular pop song, right? And that's the uh, rap version of the continuation of this uh, popular pop song. Another um, trigger could have been a proverb. So again, popular wisdom. And then uh, let's see how it becomes uh, when I uh, repify the popular wisdom. Okay, so this, uh, this is another example. I wanted to write a blog post, so I decided to start to give my 100 triggers, 100 characters trigger sentence um, as uh, something like um, about what I wanted to do. And again, this is the uh, rep generated song um, coming from this statement of intent. And then, of course, the most boring sentence in the English language, which is the start of a copyright license. Uh, I used that one to trigger again uh, the rap song, and that's what came out. I would like to just uh, briefly, uh, you can read them in the slides when you get them, uh, when, you can, when you can download them. I just would like to show one thing, uh, a few things. So the first one is that uh, often if you start with a topic, it remains in the topic. So when I talk about license uh, um, agreement, uh, copyright license agreement for, so the, this is the GNU license, um, so this, um, you can see that here the uh, words that are generated are about get, uh, paying a fee or ending up in prison or having some kind of uh, um, bre breach of, um, uh, of the law. Um, another thing that you can notice is that uh, it generates rhymes and this was uh, the reason why we chose 100 past characters instead of only 50. If you have enough past, the network is going to remember enough uh, words before that came before, and based on these words, it's going to generate the rhymes. If you, if you don't give enough past, then there is not enough uh, context uh, to generate the corresponding rhymes. So for example, here I say that I want to generate free text, and it says brick XX, or you can, you're going to have the uh, Danny, Candy, and Randy, and Grammy, and so on. So it's, uh, uh, the rhyming is something that is possible, but it depends, of course, on the number of past characters that you feed the network with. Okay. And now let's talk about Shakespearean text. Let's uh, try to uh, be more uh, polite and gentle. Um, so here, in this case, um, so I want to use the Shakespearean style. The problem is exactly the same as the generation of the rap songs, right? I have some training set with texts. I want to teach an LSTM-based network to predict similar text to the one that is in the training set. And so besides the, the material of the training set being different, the problem is exactly the same. It's a free text generation problem. So the different training set in this case is not rap songs anymore, but in this case, we are going, I, I took um, the whole text from the King Lear, the Otello and the Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, so two tragedies, uh, one comedy. Um, right, so let's see what, uh, uh, what the, the network, the same network actually did um, to generate Shakespeare-like texts. 
Okay, so we started first with a, a sentence that actually exists in the Otello and we want the, or in another tragedy, and we want the network to complete the scene, right? And it made sense. Um, I mean, it was, it didn't make always sense, but it was actually on theme. So you had, for example, the Otello and the Cassio, and uh, so the characters were more or less uh, consistent with the start, and somehow it was alternating in the dialogue between uh, different characters. So it was actually the best um, result that we got in this experiment. The second experiment was about starting. Uh, so giving, asking the network to create a complete new scene. So we just give it uh, the uh, environment, Venice. We just give it uh, the uh, characters that come in and then the start. So there is nothing already started, right? Well, I have to say that here, uh, the network didn't perform that well. So it started, the style is the Shakespeare style. So it uses the old English to write, but it doesn't make much sense. It's a bit, uh, I don't know, I can follow on, only up to some point. So it's a much more complex task to generate something completely new than to continue something that uh, had already started. And then, of course, I tried again with the GNU license copyright uh, record because just because I want to see how something so boring can become uh, uh, can become more interesting if you use some kind of styles um, with that. And that's what came out of the Shakespeare text generation. So even here, uh, if you see, it's talking about safe and honest. It's talking about um, uh, where is it? some uh, advantage. Uh, it's talking about some anger and stealing and, and things like that. So it, it, when you start with a topic, it actually stays in the topic. And then the last one, I said, uh, well, I can give it the start of a, a rap song and I can see if uh, uh, Shakespeare can make it sound nicer. And I have to say, even here, it stays a bit in topic. The style is the writing style of Shakespeare. But for example, it talks about the unfortunate girl uh, it talks about this desperate bastard and things like that. So uh, somehow the topic is similar. So in conclusions, can AI be creative? That was my uh, question at the beginning. Uh, this was the list of mountain names, fake mountain names. And actually they were um, successful because um, they were fake names. They were uh, reminding of mountains and they could work as possible uh, new names for a clothing line. And of course, they were copyright free because they didn't exist before. Um, we generated the rap uh, songs. So we started with a, a trigger sentence and then the network was generating uh, the content of the rap song. I have to say that the training, the, the training set for the rap song was much smaller, much smaller than for the Shakespeare text. Um, so, uh, and the the whole text was a bit uh, simpler than in the Shakespeare experiment. So actually the training of the network and the application of the network was uh, faster and easier uh, in the experiment with the rap songs than with the Shakespeare text. Uh, this is the experiment with the Shakespeare text. And this is something that I've done from uh, my Italian years in school. That's uh, something that everybody, that everybody has to learn in school. So I teach, I taught the same network uh, to uh, produce a sequence of characters in Italian using as a training set uh, I Promessi Sposi, which is a famous uh, book that everybody in Italian school study. So this is, uh, you can see that you can also change language uh, depending on the training set. So the network, the network remains the same, but it can produce anything, uh, rap songs, mountain names, uh, that was slightly different, but so let's let rap songs, mountain names, uh, Shakespeare text, and uh, different language text based on the training set that you are using. Uh, okay, and then yeah, that's it. That thank you for your attention. And if there are some more questions, Catherine, you want to take back the screen? Um, yes, I can do so. Uh, one second. Are there any questions uh, or? Um, yeah, I have yeah, one question minutes. for you, Rosaria, actually. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions in the chat was how long does it take to generate a rep text, let's say of 1000 words? 
How long did it take on your machine to generate the rap songs? So during deployment, once the network had already been trained, oh, that didn't take long. So to generate it, it was maybe 20 minutes or 10, 20 minutes on a simple laptop, no GPU, no nothing, no um, speed up of any kind. So 10 minutes, yeah, for 1,000 characters, that was, I was, that was what I was doing. Yeah, as I said, the Shakespeare experiment was definitely more complicated. There are some other questions. Let me see. Uh, I didn't there are, check there are a lot of questions in the Q&A part. I'm just going through them. Um, then there is a question. Is there a relationship between the number of LSTM cells and the length and the length of each sequence sample? That's something I've never tried out directly to see whether there is a direct relationship if I have a longer sequence that um, the LST, an LSTM unit with more units worked better or with more, yeah, with more students. Um, but there are different things that you can try to do if you want to improve the performance of your recurrent neural network. Of course, you can increase the number of units used in the LSTM unit, or you can stack multiple LSTM units on top of each other, or the other option is to use bi-directional LSTM units. Um, hey. I can answer this one about the overfitting. Um, so definitely the, the rep songs, there was a lot of overfitting because the data set was smaller and uh, um, you know I just tried. So once they left me alone and I had some fun and I just tried to create some rep songs. Definitely could have done with a much bigger training set. I should have collected more uh, of the rep songs. Um, to keep track of the overfitting is not that easy. Um, so the, uh, I've showed the dropout layer. There are going to be some regularization that you can add, uh, or you can just check the results and then see if there is a, if there is overfitting. You can just increase the training set and you know deal with more data. Definitely. Then we have a question regarding our machine learning course. Um, there we don't have a beginners and uh, it follows the, what do you know, Rosario, do you understand what you means with follow the beginning? And so course? yeah, you need exactly. So the machine learning course is one of the advanced courses, level L4, and it should follow the level L1 and level L2. We are not going to explain NIME in the machine learning course. We assume that you already know it. Uh, it's a very dense course. It's really, really very compact. So we have no time to explain uh, any kind of NIME analytics platform nodes. So you need to come that you already know it. Also in the advanced uh, nodes like the loops or uh, the flow variables. So we are not going to explain that. So yes, it follows L1 and L2. About the containerization. Uh, so um, It's possible, sure. Uh, I'm not an expert of the con of containerization, but definitely we can. Uh, you can send us an email, and we can give you more this more uh, de details about containerization. Absolutely, it's possible. It can be done. Um, Regarding the training times, so how long were the training times for the different tasks? Uh, when I trained the network for the um, product name generation. I just trained them over one night, um, so it took quite a while, but I didn't use a machine with GPU, I just trained it on my laptop. There is a question on how to translate a thought in Italian, I have no idea. <laughs> so this one, I, I don't know. I can do some research, but I don't know. Um, what do you mean with the step in generating the text of Shakespeare? So the network is exactly the same, um, and uh, and then you just uh, feed character after character, and then you predict the next character. So it, it's exactly the same as the other network for the rap song generation. The only thing that changes is the training set. Um, so the algorithm class is organized in uh, five days. Uh, it's four hours, a bit more than four hours of uh, lessons. And then you are going to get exercises. 
um, and then you do the exercises on your own. And then the day after you come back and we comment the exercises. If anybody had problems, we show the solution and then we discuss a bit the exercise. Um, so it's definitely a lot of um, algorithm theory. Uh, there is a, a part in uh, uh, hands-on exercises though, um, definitely. And then the last day, there is going to be a bit of question and answers possible where we can clarify some of the aspects and we can clarify also uh, the implementation of some of these nodes um, in NIME Analytics platform, definitely. So it's going to be more theoretical than the classic NIME, NIME Analytics platform courses, uh, but there is going to be a part also hands-on. Um, does NIME support, support graph neural networks? Can you answer this one, Catherine? Um. I think you can use them with the Python integration, but we don't have notes for it, but I'm not 100% sure. I've never done this. So there is again the, the step stuff. So um, uh, maybe I we can go back to the slide with the deployment workflow. Okay. Um, so you mean those are the steps that you want to see? So here you read your first 100 characters, then they um, you transform them and you, you make the one hot encoding for each of the character and you make the sequence, right? You remember I've shown you with the leg column node, you can make the sequence. So you are going to have this tensor of uh, um, one hot encoded characters and then one character after the others for 100 a sequence of 100 characters. And then once you pass them in the recursive loop, you, um, the network, so this is the network, the uh, network executor is going to take them as input and predict the next character. The next character, there, there is a, going to be a bit of transformation. Uh, and then uh, after that, you uh, create the, the collection of, the, the new collection that you want to pass back into the network. So you're going to have the input 100 characters, the one more character that you have generated here, you're going to uh, put them together and kick out the first character in the previous sequence. So now you're going to use the last 99 characters from the previous sequence, you add the one character that you have generated, and then you get the new 100 character characters with which you are going to feed the network again. So the new 100 characters are going to be passed back to the recursive loop start. Again, new 100 characters, it goes into the network executor, produces the new character. Again, here there is a bit of uh, um, changing because we have to kick out the first character in the previous sequence and then add the new character that have been predicted. We are going to, again, to put together the last 99 characters from the input sequence, add the one character that we have predicted, and we get, again, a new 100 character input sequence. We feed it back into the recursive loop start, and again, and we start, and so on, and so on, and so on, and that's how uh, one character after the next, the text is generated. I don't know, did it answer, was that the question you had? Sure, uh, there were non-existent words were definitely generated, especially in the case of the um, uh, Shakespeare uh, text generation. Uh, yeah, there were definitely sometimes some non-existing words generated because at the end it takes into account only the relationship uh, among characters and less the relationship among words. So sometimes we had some non-existent words, yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, so no, the model is only generating text. I, I am, I'm not a musician, so. <laughs> but uh, in theory, it's possible also to generate the rhythm, right? Because especially you can generate a sequence of notes and then you generate the next note and then you get, you know, and then you can generate music, but I haven't done that. 
I, I only played with text. Um, so if we can deploy the nine model online without the server. Um, so um, there are some, so in, in theory, um, it's not possible, but there are some services that you might want to use, but you need to ask uh, some more, uh, we have, so some more server expert people. So it should be possible. There should be some services that allow you to do that. I, I don't know this, this question. Uh, I got this question before. Um, so I don't know the answer uh, about generating grooming process. Um, we can talk about that. You can send us an email and then you can explain how the grooming process work. Um, and then maybe uh, we can find a, a way to generate a corpus using the grooming process. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, you can just send an email to um, events at nime.com and then we can, they can redirect you to the people for the deployment uh, without the server. There is a, uh, so there, there is a page where there are the full instructions to um, install the correct Keras library and the correct Python version. Right. Yeah, you can also do this easily in the nine preferences tool. If you have Anaconda installed, and um, then you can just go to your nine preferences and create a new environment there for the for deep learning with nine, and then it will install all the libraries automatically for you. I did type it. Are oh, you did type it? Yeah, I private sent message. it privately. Okay. Uh, is this okay? I don't know what it means. Uh, if you want to elaborate on the question, is this okay? Um, I don't know what, what the answer should be. Okay. Um, yes, we will share the presentation um, and you will get an email afterwards with a link to the slides as well. there any other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, then um, I would say um, thank you to everybody. Uh, you can uh, send, uh, you can ask for more information to the, you know, uh, answering the email that you received. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending. And if you have any other questions, you can either um, write an email back to the email that you will receive, or you can ask on the NIME forum, where we are also happy to answer your questions. <laughs>